I'm your co-host, Joe Kerr. I'm here today with Gary Ray. And Gary, it's good to see you again. We shared responsibilities with writing and editing and ministry in person for I Am a Watchman Ministries for several years. Catch me up a little bit. What's going on now? I see there's some good things happening. Joe, it's good to see you again. Thank you so much for um, talking with me today. God is working around the globe, and uh, it, it, this is an exciting time in history. I've been establishing a new ministry called Set Free Indeed, and under that ministry umbrella, we're wanting to minister to incarcerated men. We're wanting to minister to at-risk teens and incarcerated teens. We have spiritual resources available. We have books and videos. We're wanting to to reach the hurting and to minister to the lost and to prepare all for the return of the Lord. That is fantastic. Certainly good timing. Uh, as you said, in these last days, there are more and more problems. And I've read that in several things that you've written recently that with the COVID pandemic and now endemic and all of the other things, the emotional strain on society as a whole is just overwhelming. And many people end up uh, doing things they wouldn't otherwise do, or people who have you know, been in trouble with the law before get back in trouble with the law because they don't have anything constructive to do. And so the prison system and that whole branch of society is just in such turmoil right now. It's true. The recidivism rate is terrible. Depression rates are high. Suicide rates are high. Um, I want to help. I, I want to share hope. And Jesus is the source of that. We're looking for bridges, how to rebridge from the church building out into the community to where the hurting people are. Sometimes it's a homeless center. I spent some time working as a case manager at a gospel mission. Sometimes it's a prison and there's a lot of hurting people there. And certainly I'm for justice and some people need to be there, but a lot of people who are in prison are really earnestly looking for a new start in life. They're wanting to regroup and connect with something good, and they're open. They're tremendously open. They're wanting to read. They're wanting to study. They're wanting to pray. And so our ministry has a heart to reach those hurting, seeking people, position them for a successful reentry, and guide them after their exit. You on both sides of that, Gary, because you know my background. I was in youth ministry for almost 20 years. So I have a heart for young people as a youth pastor. My heart was to make sure that they didn't end up in any kind of legal trouble where they would you know, be serving time somewhere. So are you working on both sides of that, keeping kids out of trouble as well as ministering to those who are already in the system? Yes, that's the desire. We are in the formative stages, but we have an arm called JTO, and it's specifically targeting at-risk teens and incarcerated teens. Perhaps they're in a juvenile detention facility, or maybe it's a camp of some sort. But yes, through love and concern and prayer partners and mentoring, we have a workbook and a study book. Uh, through these kinds of resources, we're hoping to capture those hurting hearts and position them for a positive and successful life. Are these resources that are available for people who are working with young people, whether that's in the church setting or just in a community center? There are a lot of places where folks are interacting with young people these days. So are these resources that are available to download or somebody could access those workbooks and minister to the people that they're working with? Right. This is an exciting time for us because we're just about ready to launch a series of new resources, but we do have a book on Amazon targeting teens. Uh, we have several books in development under the Set Free umbrella. They are close to completion. Uh, we have a, a subscription to a, a grant service. We've contacted a congressional representative. We've contacted a governor who seems to be open to prisoner reform. And we're praying that God will open a number of doors at the same time so that as the resources are uh, fine-tuned and ready to go, we'll have congressional or Department of Corrections level support and an open door to lead a pilot program, perhaps in the fall, involving up to a thousand people. That's our goal. That, 
Wow, that's outstanding. And are you finding those doors are open? In other words, when you say success in one area, is that something that others could replicate in systems around the country? Are they responsive to that or is it or is it difficult to get in? It is difficult to to get through that first door, but this is a scalable, easily reproducible and relatively inexpensive program. In fact, uh, our calculations for our state, which is relatively small, if just the population group that we're working with reduces recidivism rate by 20%, the state will save more than $8 million. And so we see tremendous potential and we're looking forward to God opening doors for us to move forward. It's good for you to speak their language like that, because we we can get into our religious speak and we only speak about ministry and saving their souls. And, you know, those are important things. We we have that as our mission statement as Christians. But the government looks at it from a different perspective. They're looking at how do I shrink the size of the system? How do I save money? How do I make sure that people aren't uh, returning to the system over and over and over. We're trying to keep them out of the system or right. break that cycle. I believe the main piece in that puzzle is Jesus Christ. And so under the setfreeindeed.com umbrella, we're offering a number of spiritual resources to help men and women and teens connect with the source or the anchor of our hope. We have books on discipleship. We have books that help make uh, reading the Bible easy We have books on Bible prophecy. Uh, We have uh, educational and inspirational videos. Uh, All of these are available under the Set Free Indeed uh, website, and we're excited about making these resources available. That's outstanding. So you're ministering to the spiritual needs. What else can people do? How can people participate? How can we help? Prayer is the main thing. It's just would ask prayers for the Set Free Indeed ministry. We're trying to finalize a number of resources. We've contacted a number of sources for uh, funding and for support for that open door to get into the prison system. We're open to developing new resources and to speaking about these resources at different places. I have a pastoral background. Uh, I love to preach. I love to teach. Uh, We're about to release a new book. It's uh, our first book of fiction. It's Christian speculative fiction, like The Chosen miniseries. Many are appreciating. It tells the story of Jesus, but it imagines the spiritual happenings taking place behind the scenes. And that's going to be introduced on March 2nd. The book ties into the Easter theme, and we think it's a great resource that will both inspire and embolden faith even across the globe. I've seen that resource, The Victor, and was privileged to see it early in the development process. It's an exciting project. And I've seen, there are so many now, uh, people who are in my field in journalism and other areas that are branching off into this. And it's not just uh, ministry. There are quite a few people that are doing that. Amir Tsarfadi most recently just released a novel. And uh, Joel Rosenberg, who is the founder of um, All Israel and All Arab News, has a whole series of novels, as well as several other folks that you and I know that are more in the ministry side. But why a novel? I mean, why not just teach the truth, stick with your seven churches of Revelation, hear the facts about the last days? What? What? Why a novel? Yes, well, it's a, it's a back door to connecting with people. There's a tremendous interest in society about all things spiritual, what happens in the spiritual realm. So from old movies like It's a Wonderful Life to you know, current movies like the Ghostbusters reboot, people are, are interested. Even the, the Chosen that has a strong spiritual theme has had a tremendous reach, a crossover reach. And that's our hope with the victor that skeptics and and saints uh, together will enjoy this book and read it. Uh, We're hoping that like the Left Behind series, that this would have a good crossover reach and be of broad interest to the masses. Is it general enough that somebody who isn't necessarily involved in church and ministry and that sort of thing is going to understand it? Or, Or they have to have a little bit of foundation from what the Bible teaches to really fully grasp what you're what you're saying in the novel 
Right. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, I think the novel flows in, in such a way that people with zero church background will embrace the story, understand it, and be inspired by it. Those who do have a church background will see a lot of uh, layers, uh, references to verses, uh, references to spiritual sideline stories that are uh, almost parenthetically referenced uh, in the book. It gives a deeper meaning, a, a richer read. But I think the book is going to be of interest to all audiences. Now, I've seen the project as you were writing it originally and developing it. So I, I know a little bit of the background on it. Let's let's flesh out some of that a little bit. Just some sure. definitions for folks who aren't active in this world every day. Um, the story is Satan uh, and that world and the unseen, as you said, that involves angels, demons, Satan, everything in the spiritual realm, which is just as real and just as literal as the world that you and I live in. We just don't have access to that as living, breathing human beings. Yes. So the Bible talks about all of those things. The Bible describes the character that we would identify as the enemy of our soul, the devil. Talk about that character, how it's woven into the victor and what his purpose is and, and, and how this story could even happen. Sure. So the story of the victor follows the gospel of Luke. It's the story of Jesus through the crucifixion, through the resurrection, through the ascension. But there's a backstory that comes and goes throughout the novel, and it references Satan's fall from heaven. Satan falls from heaven uh, he hates all that God loves, and in Genesis, that's humanity. So there's a beginning point where Satan attacks humanity, and humanity falls from grace, and Satan believes that he has won. The demons are celebrating, but then God has a conversation with Satan, and he says, I'm sending a redeemer. And so from that proclamation forward, there's a battle between Satan and and the forces of God to try to thwart God's plan to work through humanity to, at some point in the future, bring a Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And so there's a story of what's happening, the battles that are happening behind the scenes from Genesis to Luke chapter 2 to the birth of Jesus. And then the story really picks up in earnest. It recounts his miracles. It follows the gospel of Luke and talks about how the angels and demons are clashing amidst what we read of in the biblical narrative. Well, fill that in a little bit, because many people are familiar with the story and they kind of see, you know, they know some of the background. Okay, Satan was cast out of heaven. If folks aren't aware of that, that is found where? Satan is cast out of heaven in Isaiah chapter 14 and okay. uh, so Revelation was, 12. Okay. Uh, how detailed that is, is... Uh, is debatable, but there are clear references to Satan at one time being a favored, powerful angel of authority, and then because of pride, leading a rebellion and then being cast out of the kingdom. Okay. And then the demons that we think of as the evil beings, uh, they were originally angels. Is that how you interpret that? I do. In the story of the victor, Satan wants more authority. He has a conversation with God. I demand it. I need it. I deserve it. Uh, God says, I love you. And as long as you respect the order, uh, you will maintain your glory and your position of authority. But of course, Satan will not do that. He leads a rebellion and he tries to wage war against God in the midst of a meeting that God calls to warn all of his creation of what's about to happen. And even though he warns them to stay true and to choose well, they wage a insurrection against him. Of course, that goes nowhere. And Satan and his forces are cast out of heaven. As they're cast out of heaven, the angels that stand with God uh, stand along the, the streets of Zion, if you will, with swords raised and in a procession style, Satan and his troops are forced to leave. And that scenario is echoed in the triumphal entry, where the angels provide cover for Jesus. The demons have amassed in Jerusalem. They're wanting to kill him. They want to kill him before he gets to Jerusalem, but the angels thwart that effort by lining the streets that lead into Jerusalem and have the same kind of flaming 
torch swords raised to, to keep the demons at bay while Jesus makes his triumphal entry. Wow. I love the way you frame that because that creates a visual that people can relate to, you know, mixed in the crowd. I, I get that image of the first, uh, whatever the, the story was with Tim Allen and the Christmas character with Santa and they're all standing there watching and you have the elves intermingled with the little kids on the street. Yes. They're all watching the scene. We don't think of it that way, but that that's actually what's happening many times in the background. We don't see that conflict, but the Bible describes that conflict in a number of areas. Now we can picture a few of the ones you mentioned, uh, obviously, Satan met with Jesus at one point in the wilderness. We know that's recorded in Luke and in, also in Mark, but we, we have that. We have the one where you talk about where he was cast out of heaven, and obviously all of the events that happened at the death and resurrection. Are there other times in Scripture where the devil is clearly interacting with humanity? Well, I've, I've woven that into the story. So, for example, uh, in the story of Jesus uh, traveling across the scene and ministering to the man in the graveyard who's possessed with demons called Legion. In the midst of coming over, there's a storm on the sea. And I wrote into the story that the demons saw the storm and saw it as an opportunity to kill the Christ. And so they go under the water, their talons are attached to the bottom of the boat. They're trying to shake it. Angels are on the top trying to stabilize the boat kind of a spiritual warfare going on there while greater forces are battling overhead. So I write in some backstory that way. Of course, Jesus wakes up, uh, stills the water. They get to the other side. Jesus goes into the graveyard and cast out Legion into the, the herd of pigs. So the stories are respected. So speculative fiction from an editor's perspective, I understand what that is. Some of the listeners may not. Speculative fiction is basically just the story of what could have happened. It is logical. It is, uh, you know, actually possible. It doesn't have any record biblically that that is what happened, but it could have. Is that basically what you're doing with the storyline? Yes. So for example, the Bible talks about what happened between the cross on Friday and Resurrection Sunday. The Bible talks about how Jesus went into the depths, into the prison, and proclaimed liberty to the captives. Well, most Bible scholars take that to mean Jesus proclaimed himself to be the victor over the sting of death, over the death grip that Satan had on humanity by offering redemption and salvation and atonement for our sins. So in the story of the victor, Jesus ascends into hell with a cohort of angels, and there's a tremendous battle as Satan and his demons are in some kind of great theater underground celebrating the fact that Jesus is dead. There's a great battle scene, and Jesus there proclaims himself to be the victor. So that would be an example of adding a dimension to the story. That was one of my favorite scenes in the book where you have that arena environment and you have the demonic hosts and they're expecting one outcome. And in the middle of the battle, everything shifts and uh, there's that hush and that shock and that, wait, this is not the way we saw it going. And that is actually true to the biblical narrative as well, because Satan, to your point, you said earlier, Satan's goal has always been worship. He, he expects, wants, and does everything in his power to bring about worship, people worshiping him, his plans, his goals for humanity, and I've said before, you and I talked about this once at one of the um, conferences, that Satan has never had an original thought in all of his existence. All he does is copy, mimic, or attempt to thwart what God is already doing. Talk about Satan's long-term goals for humanity. We, we believe the rapture is imminent. It could happen while we're still recording this, or it could be 100 years. We don't have any idea, and the Bible doesn't tell us when it's going to happen. Jesus was very clear that nobody knows when it's going to happen. So if Satan's plan were to continue going forward, what, what is his long-term mission? What, what is Satan's goal? 
in Revelation 12, we read that Satan knows his time is short. So he knows the end of the story. He knows that God is going to win and judgment is going to come. But in Revelation 12, it, it says not that he, he steps back or he apologizes or seeks forgiveness of mm -hmm. any kind. It says it puts him in a rage. And that's where we're at now. Satan is in a rage and he hates everything that God loves. He hates every good thing in our lives. And so right now he's working to destroy everything, education systems, the traditional family, good government, good laws, everything that's good, everything that's God honoring. He's a, he's a power grabber and he's looking for control. And the book of Revelation talks about those last seven years where the Antichrist will be embodied by Satan, will seize ultimate control and have control of the economy, over many militaries, over religion and different world systems. So I think that's his ultimate goal, to destroy as much as he can now and to increasingly gain control over a particular ideology or thought that rejects God. If it's not going to worship him directly, the secondary goal is to keep people from affirming, recognizing, and worshiping God. I've often thought the Bible describes Satan as a liar and the father of lies. The King James Version describes it very aptly. When he speaks a lie, he speaks his native language. Yes. In other words, he, he can't do anything else. So I've had people ask me if he knows he's going to lose, you know, at some point, don't you just throw in the towel? Uh, like you said, apologize, God, my bad. Can we start, you know, uh, but he doesn't. I have, and this is just my opinion. I don't have anything to base this on scripturally, but it's my opinion that if you are a liar by nature and it is ingrained in your character you lie to yourself too. So when Satan, even though he knows he's going to lose, he's already read the back of the book and he knows how it turns out, but he's lying to himself. I can still pull this off. Yes. Is, do you see that yeah. at all? Is that even valid? I, I agree. I don't understand it. It's incredible pride, hubris. It, nothing will thwart him. Satan knows that God has a plan for humanity and that God has our back and nothing's going to stop that. It's played out again and again and again throughout time. So it's amazing to me that Satan keeps trying. In Luke chapter four, Satan tempts Jesus in the wilderness after Jesus has an extended time of prayer and fasting. There's three temptations that come to Jesus and he overcomes each one of them. So you would think that after all of that, after all of the victories, after Jesus, even as a humble human, could withstand the onslaught of Satan, that Satan would say, okay, I'm out. But at the end of that story, the Bible says, and Satan left, which is good. And then it says, and then he looked for an opportune time to do it all over again. So nothing is going to slow him down. And we need to realize that in our own life, if we've had victory over sin yesterday or today, Great. Praise the Lord. But it does not guarantee that we will not have struggle and temptation and a spiritual attack tomorrow. So for me, it just emboldens my faith and my commitment to keep short accounts and to, as you say, be ready for the rapture and try to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. Gary, this all sounds great. So how can folks get their hands on the victor? How can they find out more about the ministry to those incarcerated, and how can they participate? Thank you for asking. Yes, under the umbrella, setfreeindeed.com, you can find all of these resources. Setfreeindeed.com will take you to books and videos, a profile of our developing prison ministry, and a profile on the new book, The Victor, which will be available on March 2nd. That's outstanding. Well, we will look forward to that. And of course, uh, you've already worked with your agent for the movie rights, and we'll <laughs> expect to see that coming out in the fall. Um, I'm sure that uh, there are several actors that would um, be happy to play several of those roles. And, um, you know, the Lucifer show is getting canceled, so maybe he's available. Who knows? <laughs> we'll see. Thank you very much, Joe. Appreciate it. Good to see you again, your Gary. Work, your heart. Yeah. Amen. God bless. God bless.